Well, all right, all right. How's everybody doing? Good. Well, welcome to church today, man. It is great to have you guys with us here in Malvis and over in Mobile. It is great having everybody in church. Uh, this is a good weekend. It's a good weekend to be here. Uh, and next weekend, we've got a couple of really big things happening that I want to tell you about real quick. Um, one is next weekend, we are launching our third location um, in Foley. Man. I really hope, Mobile, that you guys weren't as slow as everyone over here, but um, let's try that one more time. Next weekend, we're launching our third location in Foley. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. That makes me feel better. Uh, next weekend's huge. Um, it's going to be so great. Pastor Ben and the team are ready, and everybody's excited and cannot wait to launch. So be, be praying for those guys this week. Um, it's huge. And then also help us out. Get the word out. Do whatever you can do um, through Facebook and Twitter and just old school invites or phone calls or knocking on doors. Whatever you can do. If you know anyone that lives in South Ball and then you need to get them to Foley Middle School next Sunday. It's going to be incredible. It's a beautiful place. It's perfect for what we're doing and just the way God has orchestrated and worked it all out is just incredible. So don't miss it if you're in that area and then help us get the word out. And then the other thing about next weekend is that it's Father's Day. Are there any dads in the house excited about Father's Day? <laughs> Guys, it's like, do I need to leave and come back and we just start the whole thing over? Like, that was pitiful. Guys, this is the one day a year that's all about you. All right, and listen, girls clap, chicks clap, like guys grunt, right? Come on, are you excited about Father's Day next weekend? Good. I, I could still hear the ladies clapping, that's good. Um, la last service, that somebody literally hawked a lung, like right there during the grunt, that was terrible. Um, but listen, next weekend's gonna be awesome. I wish that I could give you all of the, kind of the surprises and let you know what's coming, guys, but trust me, you're not gonna wanna miss next weekend. It's gonna be awesome. Um, and so invite, invite, invite. Let everybody you know, get your dad and your friend's dads and your friends here, um, because it's really, really gonna be an awesome weekend. Um, all right, well, let's get into the word for today. Are you excited about that? Yeah. Are you ready for that? Good deal. Um, and those of you that don't know, I'm Trey, and you're kind of stuck with me today. Um, so, uh, but let's go ahead and get right into the word. There is a, uh, there's an article that I read this past week that really kind of stirred something inside of me. Um, there's an article that I, in the New York Times that just simply said that 30% of Americans um, have a sense of fulfillment or purpose in their life currently with where they are at work, their career, what they do. Um, there's just very little purpose. And if you expand that globally, it goes down to 13%. 13% of people around the world feel a sense of purpose and a sense of fulfillment in their everyday life. Mainly, that article was talking about their place of work or what they do for a living. Most people feel like it's just for a paycheck. It's just a grind. It's just punching the clock. It's doing what we got to do so that we can get those things paid, that we can eat, we can do. There is no purpose behind it. And as believers, and even those of you that maybe that haven't, that are not believers yet, and you're just kind of checking this whole thing out, um, listen, there's something so much more to you than that. I mean, God has literally um, ha has a, a greatness within each and every one of us that's just waiting, a purpose that's just waiting to be awakened. And yet most people just kind of mindlessly walk through life like that. I mean, it's just a grind. It's just, you know, most people, you know, they probably wake up in the morning just hoping, just let me get back to the bed tonight. Just let me get through the day. Let me get through the stuff. Let me make it one more day. And there, there is no purpose. I just work a job. I just do this thing. I just handle this and I handle that. And there's so much more to that. And the really great news today is that God specializes in using ordinary people. Like, that's his specialty, all right? So that's good news for us, right? Because we're ordinary, we're just, we're ordinary people, and that's where God's specialty is. I mean, you know, for you extraordinary people, he can use you too. Like, you know, he can. He doesn't near as much, but he specializes in ordinary people, in people just like me and just like you that work hard, that just do life, that love our kids. He uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things all through the Bible. Very rarely do you see these naturally extraordinary people being used by God. There's probably a lot of reasons for that, but God specializes in ordinary people. 
And he has called us and destined us and put a purpose in us to live a greater life. Jesus said in John 14, 12, he said, I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I've been doing, and he will do even greater things than I have been doing. Just let that sink in for a moment. It's not saying that you're going to be greater than Jesus, but it's saying that you will do greater things than Jesus. Now compare that to the 30%, the only 30% that even feel somewhat fulfilled in life and their purpose. I mean, look around right now. It is anybody doing greater things than Jesus. But that's exactly what he said we should be doing. We should be living. We should be experiencing that kind of life. And it all comes back to that word faith. You've got to have faith in him. You've got to have faith to do the big things. You've got to have faith to follow him. You've got to have faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Without faith, you can never step into your purpose. You can never step into the greatness, the greater things that God has destined for you, ever. I mean, I I look across this room and I know, in Mobile too, I know that there are people, there are dreams that are just lying dormant right now because you haven't said, okay, I'll do it. I'll have the faith. I'll go. There are dreams that are just shriveling up and dying as we speak. They've been sitting on a shelf for years and years and years. And they've never been awakened. They've never been fulfilled. They've just sat there because you've got bills to pay, right? And you've got this to handle, and I've got to get to soccer practice, and I've got to punch the clock, and I've got to, I got to build that portfolio, and I got to, I got to get this, and I got to get my retirement figured out, and I got to get all this stuff. And so what we do is we just take purpose and destiny and what God's called us to do, and we just kind of sit it over here, and we go, one day that'll make sense. One day I'll figure out how to fit that into my life. One day it'll all come together and then I'll be able to say, yes, God, okay, I want that greater life. But right now we're in the rat race. We're in the grind and we're trying to figure it out. And what happens is we just live a mundane, mediocre life. Just a grind, day in and day out. That's what we are. But yet Jesus says, man, there's greater things. There's greater things that I want you to do. There's greater things that you can do. Just simply have faith and step into it. Most believers are not in danger of ruining their lives. They're in danger of wasting them. Wasting them. Because so many believers, this is it. Coming into this building, coming into Mobile Campus, and and, and being a part of the life of a church, that's really it. That's the greater things he's talking about. No, it's not. There's more. In every aspect of your life, there are greater things that he wants to do right where you are right in the circumstances, right where you are today. And it all comes back to that word faith, believing, stepping out and following his heart. I wanna begin in just a moment, but first I wanna, I wanna show you a story um, of a young lady in our church that just, it's just a beautiful story and we can only show you a couple minutes of it, um, but it's just awesome. And it's just, it, it kind of illustrates this so, so well that in the middle of your life, God wants to just drop some destiny and God wants to drop some purpose and God wants greater things for your life. So check this out. I think I always had this vision of how my life would go. I was gonna get married and have kids. And I did all that, but it definitely didn't end up the way I thought it was going to. And, um, I think that those expectations I, that probably nobody else really even put on me, but it was, it was like expectations that I put on myself for how my life was gonna go. I mean, I was far from perfect, but I felt like I had kind of made all the, the right choices and I had gone down all the right paths and, um, then you wake up one day and, and everything's falling apart. And it's like, but I thought, you know, I thought I made those, those choices. Um, I thought I did the right thing. I am now a divorced single mom. I have four kids. Um, and my youngest actually lives in Houston with his dad. So um, besides, you know, being a single mom, I also sometimes have to deal with the guilt of the fact that my youngest doesn't live with me too. So 
I think through my divorce, I, I kind of had gotten a little bit jaded and a little bit burnt out on organized religion and just, um, I don't think I ever really lost faith in God or, or anything like that, but I just, um, I just was tired of the show, I guess, and I just wanted my life to be genuine, and I felt like going to church was a little bit fake for me at that point in my life. There was probably a year and a half period where it just wasn't a priority at all. I just, I, I, I just didn't want to be fake. But I remember when I stepped foot in Bay, like just how at home I felt. It was just completely welcoming and everyone was so genuine. Um, the Joseph series uh, Pastor Jerry spoke on just really touched my life. I think I was at a point where I was already working a job that I loved. I'm a photographer and I absolutely love it. Um, but it just felt a little bit stale and I didn't really, I didn't really feel like I had much purpose, I guess. I was just trying to survive, trying to be a good mom, trying to make sure bills were paid. And so I remember that first week when he spoke on the fact that um, God has a dream for us. And all of a sudden it was like, I realized that he did have a dream for me, even though my life didn't go the way I thought it was supposed to go. Um, and I remember that was like, I think it was the first time I had just like a really strong glimmer of hope that like my life could still be beautiful one day. And um, about that time, I had gotten an email from a girl that my sister knows in Destin, and um, she wanted us to do some pictures for her, and they were adopting from India. Well, she said in the, in the message to me, she said, I wish we could put you in our suitcase, and I just remember thinking, that would be my dream. Like, it's always been a dream of mine to travel, and adoption is huge. It's a huge part of my life. My youngest is actually adopted, and so, it was like all of a sudden this like fire lit inside me and I was like, gosh, maybe I could, maybe we could really go to India. That would be so cool. Short version is that we did end up going to India. Um, and I think that it was like, God just was giving me a taste of, of what his dream is for me and what his plan can be in spite of the fact that I'm divorced and I have four kids and I'm a single mom and like my dreams don't have to die. I've realized that <laughs> beauty isn't always in like how things look on the outside because I feel like over the last four years I have grown so much inside and like I feel like that's what's beautiful about my life now the fact that it's a, <laughs> a jumbled mess and people can look at me and from the outside and think that maybe I don't have it all together or, or whatever but it's beautiful because of where God's brought me to in my life and, and the things that he's taught me through the, the crap that I've been through, you know? What a beautiful story. Have you ever felt that fire inside that she talked about? Or just all of a sudden you sensed and you knew, <clears throat> excuse me, that God was up to something, that there was more to this circumstance, there was more to this situation, there was something bigger than just your normal life. There's a story in the Old Testament that I want to kind of look at, and I think we can pull a lot of um, application and a lot of parallels to our life and to really every aspect of our life. Um, when it comes to living the greater things that God's called us to live. And it's the story of Elijah and Elisha. And they're prophets in the Old Testament, those of you that, that may not know. Um, Elijah was kind of the man at the time. He was the prophet, um, which was a really, really big deal. So he was the mouthpiece of God. He, was, uh, he spoke with kings and gave counsel and performed miracles. And just, I mean, he was the man. Um, and then he had an apprentice named Elisha. And Elisha was, um, was uh, turned out to be an incredible prophet in his own right. But uh, the interesting what thing was is that he was ridiculous and bold in a prayer that he prayed whenever he, he asked God to give him double and twice the anointing that Elijah had. So he asked God to give him twice the ministry, twice the impact, just, you know, give me double everything that you're giving Elijah, and God granted that. And so Elisha went on to become an extraordinary man, an extraordinary prophet, and, and he saw twice as many miracles and twice the ministry um, of Elijah, just this incredible story. Um, but the thing is, 
as incredible as Elisha ended up, he was actually one of the more ordinary people in the Bible to begin with. At, at the very beginning of his story, he was just an ordinary man. As a matter of fact, he was beyond ordinary. I mean, he was as ordinary as ordinary can get. He had very similar life that most of us have, a very monotonous life, a very boring life, a very day in and day out grind type life. And yet, all the while, God was conspiring and working something in the background. God had greater things in mind for him. And I want to pick up in 1 Kings 19. And this is a story where these two men connect. Okay, now, like I said, God had already been orchestrating some things, but this is when they first connect. Um, and it, it starts in, in verse 19. So this is 1 Kings 19, 19. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied. What have I done to you? So Elisha left him, went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and become his servant. Now, before we get too far into this, I really want us to talk about real quick what Elisha's life was like before any of this. Before Elijah ever rolled up at all, Elisha is there, and he is plowing fields for his, for his living, his life. So just put your, just kind of go there for a moment and just think about the life that he lived. It's a good life. It's hard work. It's tough. Nothing wrong with it. But yet every day, day in and day out, he had the exact same view, right? I mean, just think about it. Oxen rears for days, right? Literally years. Like that's all the man did was stare at butts and their big old hairy donkey butts. Okay, like that's all that he did. Like every single day of his life, that's all they did was just look at donkey rears. And then when you think about the smell and the life and the hard work and all this stuff that he put in, that's all that he was. He was an ordinary guy working an ordinary job, doing an ordinary thing and working really hard and very diligent, but there was nothing extraordinary about him. There was nothing, absolutely nothing that would have given us a hint that Elisha had an extraordinary call on his life, nothing. There was nothing about his story. There was nothing about what he was doing that would have said, this guy's got some potential. I just can't wait to see what God's going to do with this kid. He's plowing a field. That's all he's doing. He's just out working and doing something, a grind, just something that's extremely normal, something extremely ordinary. And yet God had huge, huge plans. That gives me, the ordinary guy, a lot of hope that God had plans for him. Now listen, this is key. I'm not necessarily saying that God is going to want you to do something different. I'm just saying he's going to want you to live different. He's going to want you to think different. He's going to want you to, to have different passions and a different way of looking at life, a different way of thinking. I know it's very, very easy for you to hear me and go, oh, so, so you're, wanting me to, you're wanting me to change my job. No, that's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying I want you to approach life with a greater things mentality, that God wants more out of my life. I'm not saying, you know, I think a lot of times we mix it and we go, oh, he's saying greater. What he really means is better. We, you know, we kind of replace it with the word better. Oh, that means I'm going to get a better house. I'm going to have a better life. I'm going to have a better salary and better this and better that. I'm not saying that. I'm saying what he wants is he wants greater for you. He wants greater purpose. He's not necessarily saying that there's a better job out there for you. Maybe he is, but he's not right now. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying what if you just were to show up at your current job with a greater sense of purpose? Right? Instead of just, well, here I am again, punch a clock. I'm just going to go through the motions, whatever. But what if I were to actually engage my work with a greater sense of purpose? There's a reason I'm there. I'm not just there to punch a clock. I'm not just there to do the thing that I'm always doing. I'm there for a reason. I'm there for a purpose. I'm definitely not saying that there's a better husband out there for you. Right? I'm not saying that, but I am saying that there is a greater way of approaching your marriage. There's a greater way that you could love your husband or love your wife. There's a greater way that you could encourage and support one another and watch what happens to that marriage. I'm not saying there's another thing, well, fine, this isn't working out. Trace that, that, I, that I should bail on it. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying, instead of that, you need to step out of that, maybe I'm saying that you need to step up into a greater purpose, a greater call, a greater destiny in your life. And it all comes back to faith. 
It all comes back to faith. All right, let me get back to the story. Um, so Elijah shows up. Now, again, Elijah's the man, right? Elijah is the king. He's the Mick Jagger of prophets, right? He's got swagger for days. He's the coolest cat in the world. He probably smells bad because he lives in the woods, but he's cool. I mean, he's just the man. And so he walks up, and listen, he does not stop and sit down with Elisha and go, you know, let me have some counseling sessions. Let's figure out where, where your strengths are. Let me see your application. How many hours a week can you put in? Like, let's consult. Let's figure this out. Let's go see a job fair, a life coach. Let's figure this thing out. No, he literally just drops the cloak on him. He drops this mantle on him. The mantle represents Elijah's anointing, Elijah's purpose, Elijah's destiny. And he literally just walks over and bam, drops it on him and walks. He just walks off. That's it. There's no meeting. There's no stop. He just walks off. Listen, this is a huge moment. Elijah obviously doesn't think so. He's like, whatever, and walks off. But Elisha, this is the moment when that when that, that mantle touched his life, his destiny was awakened. His purpose was awakened. The fire lit inside of him. Something happened. Something amazing happened. And listen, there was absolutely nothing before this that gave us un, any indication that this man was built for significance. Yet God saw him completely different. And God dropped that on him. And there's two things from this point on the way that Elisha responds, there's two things that we can learn about faith and we can learn about our purpose. And the first one is this. <clears throat> the first one is this. You don't have to understand fully to obey immediately. You don't have to understand fully to obey immediately. When God tells you something just like this, the moment that destiny was awakened, the moment that cloak dropped on him and all of a sudden he went, there's more to this. I see it now. I get it. There's a fire lit. Man, he took off after Elijah. He didn't wait. And I love what he said because he goes, he goes, hey, just let me tell mama bye. I, I don't want to make mama mad, right? Nobody wants to make mama mad. Just, just let me tell mama bye because I'm all in. I'm there. I'm done. I mean, whatever you need, I'm there. Just let me tell mama bye. And he takes off. He's in. Just like that drop of a hat, one word, he is completely in. He doesn't stop and go, well, let me pray about this first. <laughs> right? Hello. He doesn't say, well, I need 21 days of prayer and fasting before I can follow the destiny that you put on my life, Lord. He doesn't say, let me go consult my pastor and get some counseling over this. Right? None, none of that. He just says, okay. And he went for it. He felt the call of God on his life. He stepped out and he went for it. You know, it's crazy. So many times in the Bible, you see that God doesn't hand out details very often. I mean, very, very, very seldomly does he give any kind of details. Typically, it's just go. It's just do. It's just, you know, it's, it's a direction. Even in the Old Testament, you see Abraham and Moses, these huge heroes of the faith. And yet, when God told them to go, it was very simple directions that could easily be summed up in that word, go. Here's a general area, go. <laughs> You'll figure out the rest later. You'll figure it out later. He knows the details. All right? He's got all the details figured out. I mean, he knows every hair on your head, but he knows you don't have any business knowing all the details. You couldn't handle all the details. And really, I think if you did know all the details, you'd try to skip some steps or you try to, you try to figure it out on your own way. Well, I know where I'm going to end up at by step six, so let me just go ahead and figure out how I'm going to get there without all these other steps. And we'd never learn how to walk by faith. We'd never learn how to walk um, after him and with him in everything that we do. I love the story of Peter walking on water. It's a very similar thing. He sees Jesus and he calls out, hey, if it's really you, Jesus, then tell me to walk to you. Tell me to come out on the water to you. And what does Jesus say? One word, come. Come. And what does Peter do? He jumps out of that boat and takes off. He doesn't stop and think about it. And Jesus doesn't give him any kind of tutorial on how to walk on water. He doesn't give him a quick little lesson. Hey, listen, you're going to have to kind of sway with a little bit, right? You're going to have to lean with it. You're going to have to rock with it. You're going to have to high step every now and then because you're going to have that big wave is going to hit you now. Like you just, you got to kind of learn to groove with it a little bit. Just take it easy. Take it slow. It's going to take a look at used to. Now, Peter, slow down, Peter. Slow down. Take it easy. Nothing. He just says, come. Come. In other words, take the first step and then I'll give you a second step. But take the first step. Let me see you have the faith to take the first step. When it's God talking to you, one word is always enough. 
When this thing is dropped in your spirit, one word is enough. Some of you right now, your marriages are falling apart or, you know, you're struggling, you're having a hard time and you're thinking about ending it. And the one word you're hearing is stay, stay. Hey, you don't have to understand fully to obey immediately. You don't have to understand fully. That's not for you to know. For you, it's just to obey. Just do what he's telling you to do. You may be facing a health crisis right now, and things are just looking bad, looking ugly, and it's scary, and it's hard. And the one word you're hearing is trust. Trust. You don't have to understand fully to obey immediately. Just do what he says. You don't have to figure it out. Well, how's this going to work out? And how's this going to happen? And when, and when is this going to happen? And what? No, no, no. Trust. Trust. Obey immediately. No matter what's going on. You're, some of you guys may be praying about the future of your family. More kids or this or that. And the one word you're hearing is adopt or foster. And we start, oh, well, you know, international or domestic? Are we gonna, where are we going to get the funds? And, and, and is, it, is it local? Is it, a, is it a boy or is it a girl? Is it this or is it that? And he said, no, 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 just go. It's not for you to figure out right now. Just go. Just take the step. Some of you guys have been sitting in these seats for years and years, and you've never contributed to this place, to your, to your home church. And the one word that you keep hearing is serve. Serve. Be a part. Hey, you don't have to figure out what that looks like. You just got to say, hey, Mr. Campus Pastor, I'm in. I'm in. You don't need to know where. You don't, have to, you don't have to figure it all out. Just take a step and say, yeah, I'm in. Whatever it is, whatever is going on. There may be a young lady here that's dating a jerk, loser, punk that just treats you like trash, but you just want to get married so bad. I've been single for 10 years or whatever, and I just want to get married so bad that you're putting up with this loser that treats you like trash, and everybody else knows it. And God's giving you one word. You know what that one word is? Nobody? It's dump the punk and move on. <laughs> Thus saith the Lord. Sometimes we've got to have more than one word, right? <laughs> hey, listen, you have got to be willing to move when he tells you to move. You've got to be willing to step when he tells you to step. You don't have to understand fully to obey immediately. Like Elisha, man, just go. The second thing that we learn is this. Those God uses the most are the ones who hold on to the least. The ones that God will use the most are the ones that hold on to the least. I mean, what Elisha does in this next part is he makes sure that there is no plan B and there's nothing to return to. He surrenders everything. Check out verse 21. It says, Elisha took the yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah. Now, I can kind of understand him killing and, and burning the cows. That's a sacrifice. That's part of their culture. That's a big deal. But for him to burn his livelihood, for him to say, I'm all in. I am completely, there's nothing going to hold me back. There's nothing that's going to pull me back. There's nothing that I'm going to be dragging with me. I am absolutely done. I am burning it. And this is beyond ridiculous. This is completely rid ridiculous. It is a picture of total surrender to the call and the destiny on his life. A total, a picture of total surrender. He literally folds. He gives him everything. And you see this through scripture all the time. Going back to Peter, a very similar thing. Uh, Jesus shows up, and Peter, they, this is Jesus and Peter's first encounter. And they're there, and Peter's a professional fisherman, guys. I mean, he's got boats and crews, and this is a big deal. He's not just a little cane pole guy out, on the, out, out there on the lake, right? He shows up, and he's had a terrible day. And Jesus, he doesn't know Jesus, and Jesus says, hey, going out a little deeper. Try right out there. And he's, all right, whatever. So he does it. He goes on out. And the Bible says he pulls in so many fish that the nets begin to break. They have to pull another boat over, and they start putting fish into that boat. And Peter says, whoa, man, you're incredible. I'm an idiot. Like, you're cool. I'm not. You should probably leave me alone now. Like, you're just so cool. And, and Jesus says, no, 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 you come in, in with me, and you be a fisher of men. And I love what Peter does. We read right by this, but the next statement, Peter, is, or the next verse in the Bible, it says that Peter left everything and followed Jesus. And we read right by that. But I want you just to kind of contextualize that with your life. Put that in your circumstance. I'm not telling you to do this. I'm just telling you to think about how big it is. 
Yeah, but I went to school for that. Yeah, but I, I, I did this, and I spent years and years, and I built this company, and I built this, I built that. And Peter says, I'm done. Yep, that's what you want me to do. That's what I'll do. And he follows him. He walks. He follows him. The moment he said it, he follows him. Some of you guys, God is going to give you a plow-burning faith. There are things in your life that are holding you back from the destiny, that are holding you back from the call of God. And it's keeping you from that next thing. It's keeping you from being everything that God has called you to be. You know what? I'm not necessarily talking about, I'm not talking about you walking in and burning the building down because you're so mad at work. You're like, well, fine. I'm done. That's not what I'm saying at all. There are things in your life, though, whatever it is, that are holding you back from your destiny. Maybe it's an emotional thing. Maybe it's a physical thing. Maybe it's a spiritual thing. Whatever it is, there are things that are holding us back, that are keeping us from our purpose, our greatness in God. And you know what? You can't hang on to that and run forward and keep your eyes on Him and follow and trust in Him. You just can't do it. Some of you are holding on to unforgiveness that you've had for years and years and years. You know what? You will never experience the greatness of God until you can let that go. Ever. Some of you are holding on to shame. You're holding on to past stuff and blame. You're holding on to, to sin. Some of you guys are still addicted to stuff. Listen, until you can burn that plow, you will never enter into the greatness of God. You'll never enter into the greater things that God has planned for you. You'll never walk that way. Whatever it is, man, whatever is going on in your life, a past relationship that you just can't get rid of, this, that thing that just keeps coming back, hey, let it go. Be done with it. It's over. Now burn that plow. One of my favorite things as a dad, you know, not quite a year ago, almost a year ago, I taught Bella how to ride her bike. One of the best things, one of the most fun experiences. Can be a little frustrating, right? But it's still, it's a fun experience. But, you know, with Bella, it was so hard for her to, because she wanted me to keep holding on to the bike, right? And so I'm kind of running with her and she's checking, no, no, don't let go, dad, don't let go, no, no, no. Like that. And she could never experience the bike, but the moment that I let it go, then all of a sudden she could fully experience what riding a bike is like, right? And then all of a sudden it's not this, this uh, 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 but the moment I let it go, it's like she's just rode, woo, woo, let it go, <laughs> let it go, right? I mean, in that moment, everybody want to sing it now? Everybody? <laughs> Right In that moment, she could ride. She could be free. She wasn't constantly checking, hey, are you there? Are you there? Are you there? And how many of us go through life dragging a plow? <laughs> no, God, I really want what's, what, what you want from me. I really want the forward thing. I really want these greater things. But, but there's this thing. What if that doesn't work out? I still need this. What if this, what, what if this happens? I still have that. We, we, you can't live that way. You can't live constantly back and forth. It's, just, it's not going to happen. God wants you to burn the plow and move on. Whatever that thing is, let it go. Let it go. It, you don't need that. It, for so many of us, it's just security. You'll never, you'll never experience the greater things of God until you can let that stuff go, until you can be done with your own security and put all your hope and all your dreams in Him. Put everything that you are in Him and Him alone. That's the only place that you'll find greater things because good enough is not okay. As believers, we're not meant for baseline living. We're not meant to just get by. We're not meant for just good enough. We're meant to live a life of greater things. And that means stepping out in faith. That means that you gotta do big things. That means that you gotta, you gotta obey immediately even when you don't understand fully. You've got to, and you've got to surrender everything because those that God uses the most are those that hold on to the least. I mean, you've got to be willing to burn the plows in your life so that you can enter into the greatness of God, so that you can step into the destiny, the greatness that's inside you right now. No matter what shape, color, what, what talents and gifts you have, it doesn't matter. God has a destiny for you, a plan for you right now in this place where you are, and you're going to have to step out in faith to follow that to go after it with everything that you are. Lord, I thank you for this day and I thank you for this opportunity, God, to share your word. And Lord, I pray that you would encourage us right now, that you would point out these things in our life. Lord, that you give us the faith, Lord, to say that we need to burn a plow in your name. And I just wanna ask you guys real quick, be honest with me, keep your head bowed and your eyes closed. Right now, if you would say that I've got a, I have a plow in my life that I need to burn, I want you just to slip your hand up. Mobile, you guys too, everybody. 
Come on, slip your hand up. If you've got a, if you say, you know what, I want to go after God. I want to go after everything he's got, but there's something in my life that's holding me back. Raise your hand. Don't put it down yet. Raise your hand. Come on, everybody. That's a lot of people in this room. Now you can put it down. Keep your heads down. I want to ask you one more question. Today, if you're, if you're willing and you're ready to say, today's the day I'm going to burn that plow. This is it. I'm done with it. I'm done with something holding me back from the greatness that God has planned for me. Now raise your hand back up if that's you. Lord, the hands that are raised right now, I pray over them, and I pray, God, that their faith would swell up inside of them. In Mobile as well, every single person that's raising their hand right now, Lord, I pray that faith would well up inside of them. God, and that they would step out and they would follow you, whether it's one word or ten words. God, they would follow you with all that they have and all that they are, that they would experience the greatness of you the greatness of life in you. And Lord, I pray that whatever we have to do to burn the plows, Lord, I pray that today we commit to burn plows. Whatever's holding us back, whatever that thing is, that old mindset, that old fear, that old worry, that old shame and bitterness, whatever it is, God, we will not let it hold us back anymore. We are gonna move after you. We are gonna run after you. We are gonna go after you with everything that we've got. In your name we pray, amen. One last thing. I know that there are some people here today that as we talk about these greater things, maybe you're so distant and you're so far away from God that you can't possibly imagine how this pertains to you and how this is relevant to your life. And I want you to know that even if you don't know Jesus or you've been running from him or you've, you've just never even, you've never even been in a church maybe, you've, you've never known God, I want you to know that even you Right where you are right now, God has a plan for you. He loves you so, so, so much. And no matter what the excuses that you've used for years and years and years to stay away, to keep him at a distance, to push him back, no matter what it is, listen, none of it means anything. Because as you're here today, I believe that you feel a love and an acceptance that you've never felt before. Right where you are, no matter what you came in here carrying, no matter what problems you walked in with, no matter what history, none of that matters, man. Jesus is here and he loves you just the way you are. And God loves you so much that he actually sent Jesus who had no sin, who had never made a mistake to this earth to take on every one of your mistakes. And he died a painful death just so we could have life, so that we could know our father. Today, he wants you to begin a relationship with him. He wants you to know him and he wants you to live in the fullness of life. So bow your head one more time and I wanna give you the opportunity if, that's, if there's anyone here that would say, I absolutely, today is the day I wanna meet Christ. I wanna meet Jesus. I wanna begin a relationship, a friendship. I wanna know this love and experience it on a daily basis. If that's you, raise your hand real quick. Go ahead and slip it up. There's one right here. Anybody else? Anybody else? Slip it up real quick. All right, I know there was at least one. Let's pray. In Mobile, there may have been a few over there. Let's pray real quick. Everyone pray this together. And the one young lady that raised her hand, pray this with all of your heart. Jesus, I love you. Forgive me of my sins. I surrender my life to you. I give you everything. I love you with all that I am. I give you my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can we celebrate? Can we celebrate the life and the lives of Mobile right now? Amen.